Rings of Power Episode 3, the show that brings hope to the universe. Because if these showrunners can get a billion dollars to make this, then anyone can. We start with the impossible elf and he's been captured by orcs. We all know Amazon loves to inject allegory into their TV shows. And the orcs are stuck in these tunnels, covering up the roofs. They are terribly scared of the sunlight. They go out in the sunlight and they get burnt. And I think that could only mean one thing. Gingers. But they're dragging their impossible elf through the tunnels. And it's taken him a while, but he may just have realized what happened to all of those other villagers. Because it really wasn't obvious where all those bodies went. But we get dragged through this tunnel for far too long. For Adar. Now, Adar is the name of the episode. It's not in it. Seriously, there hasn't been this much false advertising since they made a film called Kill Bill and didn't kill Bill. But the orcs get some restraints, put them on the elf, and make him classically chained. This absolutely isn't foreign allegory being injected into a classic piece of British literature. Although why a bunch of gingers want to chain him up, I have no idea. But he gets grabbed, turns around to fight him, and finds out, oh no, there's just a load of actual proper elves here. Of course, we all have our hair cut to show our ears off. Yeah, as you know, Galadriel, the one who has to hide as an elf, therefore can't show the pointy tips of her ears. We've reached a point with Rings of Power where the length of your hair is a plot device. I now genuinely think that all these people have short hair, specifically, because otherwise how on earth were you supposed to know they were elves? Because we just made them look like humans in every other regard, so the only thing that tells you they're elves is their ears, so... You have to see them. But it turns out somehow all the elves have been captured. I honestly have no idea how his boss got captured. Did he go into a hole just to find out what was on the other side as well? I will never know. No, I mean that literally. They never tell you how any of these people got here. <laughs> Not important information. Don't ask questions. So all these elves have been gotten into a pit to uh, just dig around for absolutely no reason whatsoever, as far as I can tell. They're all just like prodding dirt and stuff. They don't go anywhere. They don't dig anything. This is the size of the set they have for the entire episode, and it never changes. But we go back through the Orcs who are just like beating people up randomly for no reason. Because you know, people dig holes a lot better when they've been beaten within an inch of their lives and can't move. But oh no, Galadriel's awake! She wakes up like it's a horror film. And given a personality that we see in this episode, she could star in one. Halbrand comes, gives her some food, and she's like, oh, what if it's poisoned? I mean, she can't be that desperate to eat. She was already planning to swim for a few more months yet. What was she going to do? Catch fish on the way? But she goes on deck. Welcome to the Numenorean boats, who have slogans that can only be described as complete and utter lunacy. This is meant to be an impressive shot. That's why we've got a green screen and a fan in his hair. One of the Eldar. You might as well be an elf yourself, mate. You've got longer hair than most of them. But he says, I am obliged to deliver you to my betters. How very monarchy of you. But Rings of Power, never one to disappoint when it comes to quality dialogue, has this bizarre exchange. To what port do we sail? See for yourself. So she's asked a question and he's refused to answer it. Oh, well, you know what's going to happen next. We're nearly there. Nearly where? Yeah, we got to ask it again. Look, he refused the first time. I'm sure if we just repeat it, he'll be fine. Home. You smug little twat. And she's like, oh no, he's stolen my dagger. I'm pretty sure he took that just so Halbrand can get his end away later on. She takes a step towards it as if she's planning to take on the entire boat in a fight. This is Rings of Power. She might be able to. <laughs> but she manages to restrain herself as we spend the next five minutes just doing aerial shots over landscapes. Oh, there's a tower. A massive face. Now that is one hell of a nose. What is this place? I always think if you're going to ask a question, you should do it over the waterfall so no one can hear you. The island kingdom of Numenor. Numenor. I can't roll my R's. I really wish I could to take the piss. But then we get more trailer shots and we get back to the CGI landscapes where the music again just really wants you to know how epic all of this is. It's okay, we get the message, dude. I don't know if you get the member berry references which they're doing here, but we cut to the actual set, which they were so proud of that they'd built in real life. We built an entire city and it's got graffiti on the walls and everything. And it's a good job they built it because not only is it going to go to an entirely different country for the next season, but they use it to get off a boat in. No, I'm not joking. That's all they use the set for. <laughs> but then Galadriel starts condescending towards Hellbrand. These aren't like you. These are people who are stood against Morgoth unlike your ancestors, the evil people who decided to go with Morgoth, and that's why you've got dirty, stinky clothes like a hobbit. Your ancestors stood with Morgoth. These men stood with the elves. Coincidentally, the people that sided with Morgoth, had they met you, Galadriel, or no? Just wondering, just wondering. One meeting with Galadriel was known to make you want to destroy the entire Earth. But as a reward for siding with the elves, they got this island. The island kingdom of Numeror. But she says the elves used to come here freely. But it's changed much since we last visited. Do I detect a note of envy? Not envy. 
Sorrow. Let's be honest though, that's not Numenor doing that to her. She's just miserable all the time. And Amazon, I know people complain that Wheel of Time was too clean, but let's be honest. You're just taking the piss. There is such a thing as overcorrection. <laughs> she says elves used to come here all the time and then they were turned away by them. We have no idea why. Maybe it's the pompous attitude that got to them, I don't know. Why? We may be about to find out. That's actually a lot more accurate than she intended. <laughs> Because he takes them to meet the Queen, after pausing for Halbrand to look at the forge. What I like about Rings of Power is it's just so subtle. Subtle. I'd kind of like this as an Assassin's Creed level, to be honest. That might be the most over-engineered set of bells I've ever seen. But he takes them to meet the Queen, holding court. This is going to require a soft touch, some political nuance, a diplomatic flair. Obviously a job which Galadriel is perfect for, being a lady. I suggest we set history aside for the moment. Show some restraint. That's good advice, but unfortunately he's got dangly bits, so she's not going to pay attention to that. Let's try not to antagonize these people. Have you met Galadriel? She could antagonize her own reflection. But he requests an audience with the Queen, and the gods like, she's occupied. Occupied. Like, yeah, she's surrounded by about 50 different people. I'm sure two more aren't gonna hurt. But instead, it just backs up and shows him that he's brought an elf with him. It's a good job her hair wasn't covering them up this time, otherwise the guard would have not understood the message at all. Yeah, you brought me a five foot two woman in maternity gown. What do you expect me to do with that, mate? Welcome to the wide-ranging expressions of Galadriel's diplomatic talents. So he lets them through. We've got a guy who looks more like a wizard than the wizard that fell from the sky. And, of course... Muriel, the person who isn't the person she is and didn't take the position that she took. Tolkien put stars in the sky and we're just following what he laid out. Now this scene ping-pongs between a few different ideas and it doesn't seem to be able to make up its mind exactly what it wants to show. First, we want to humiliate Halbrand. Kneel. No one kneels in Numenor. Sorry. Well, that's the last time I take advice from a pesky man. But they're asked to speak, and Galadriel decides to lay it on a bit thick. Galadriel of the Noldor, daughter of the Golden House, commander of the Northern Armies. Halbrand. I'm so important, I can roll my R's. I'm just Halbrand, I'm just a dude over here. Looking homeless, it's kind of what I do. If you go up to someone in a begging bowl and a piece of rags, maybe don't use all of your titles straight off the bat. Mind you, those aren't all her titles, as we find out later on. But Rings of Power never misses an opportunity to state the bleeding obvious. A man and an elf. Yeah, I didn't know that, dude. Cheers for that. Valuable scripting space taken up there. But Gladriel says yes, we're just acquaintances by chance. We happen to meet in the sea. And then we get an absolute piece of gold. We are companions by chance, met on the open sea. Your captain here delivered us from certain death. Delivered us from certain death. In the ocean, she was 100% certain that she would die if she hadn't been rescued by a second random chance boat. That means at the end of the first episode, she leapt into the ocean to certain death. 100% certain death. Which makes every single thing she does for the rest of the entire series ridiculous and absurd because it all started with her leaping to her certain death by her own words. Congratulations on destroying the story and logic of your entire show. And you managed to do it in just one episode. Plot, certainly not your strong point, is it? But she's like, all we ask is that you give us a boat and ship us to Middle Earth. It doesn't even say please. Grant us ship's passage to Middle Earth. Now we know from the actors talking about it that there's sort of undercurrents in this place. Some people support the elves and some people don't. And so any savvy politician isn't going to want to just publicly commit to this in the open, especially if you've not been given any reason to by the people you're talking to. So it clearly makes sense in this situation that Gladriel should be an insufferable arse. He says it's been generations since we've sent a ship from Numenor to Middle Earth. It is because of the elves that you were given this island. What? Surely you can spare a few planks and a rudder. I'm going to crap on the quality of your boat. Then I'm going to say that you don't actually deserve anything you have and everything you have belongs to us. Yes, I'm desperately in need of your resources. And so obviously, condescension is the best way forwards. Sit down, peasant. It's a few planks of wood. I'll take your firstborn while I'm here. But Murrow's like, we don't owe anything to you. We paid for this Ireland blood. And if blood be the price of passage, I will pay it. Off with her head. This is Galadriel saying that she will take on the entire island just to get a boat. Her arrogance, self-importance, and entitlement has literally no bounds. Yesterday, She-Hulk. Today, Rings of Power. They make their main character absolutely horrible to the point where you can only root for the villains in the piece. But one way or another, I will depart. Keep talking like that, love. You'll depart without a head. I welcome you to try. Based. So at this point, that Halbrand realizes that the person he's next to is a complete moron. It's like, yeah, maybe I shouldn't let the elf talk because she seems to be a couple of thousand years old and yet still hasn't 
mastered any social skills. Seriously, where did she spend the last couple of thousand years to develop that attitude? A Call of Duty lobby? But as she calls for the guards, Halbrand decides, I should do this. But he says there seems to be some hidden complications here. Maybe if we just stayed for a few days, you could talk it through, perhaps come to a better arrangement. He's more politically savvy than the couple of thousand year old elf. We started with him being an idiot that just embarrassed everyone and had him save the day in the end. Maybe we should pick what his character should be, you know, just a, just a thought. So he says you can stay three days, you can roam the island, but she must be kept uh, as a guest of the palace. I will not be made a prisoner. I don't think you have much choice, love, but he denies she's been made a prisoner and says, no, you're, you're definitely just a guest, one that can't leave. I like that guy. But as they leave, Halbrand decides that he really needs a hug. I'm so grateful that you saved my life. You have my gratitude. Absolutely nothing suspicious about that activity at all. So I can only assume this guy knows what's just happened because otherwise he's a complete idiot. But he tries to convince her, this is a paradise. We could stay here forever. I need my peace. Don't you understand? I've been searching for peace for a long time. Just let me have my peace. You expect me to leap with you back into the fire of combat immediately? Let me have some time. You leapt into the sea to save one life. After seeing how you dealt with the queen, I bet you regret that one though. I seek to save many. If there's one thing we know about you, it's that you don't care about anyone's life but your own. I have been searching for my peace for longer than you know. For both our sakes, let me keep it. The show just keeps punching you around the face with the lines about him, doesn't it? <laughs> but they go to shake hands, and like Magi, he hands her the dagger back in front of the entire room, including the guards which are watching her. But the interaction makes her all hot and bothered as she realizes, oh no, maybe I'm falling for Halbrand. <laughs> what was my husband's name again? I can't remember. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure I am sure I had a husband at some point. Apparently not. But they're like, we need to resolve this quickly. Oh, it's just an elf? Yes, but an avalanche can start with but one stone. So deep. But they describe a Lendil, say he's of a noble line, and start talking about his son. Then we cut to his son, and this entire scene is 100% pointless, and I don't know why it's in here. If you cut out all the scenes that don't tell you anything or move anything forwards, it would actually be a really short episode. Because he's learning how to be a sailor. There's lots of just running around and pulling on ropes. Oh look, I'm daydreaming again. The islands are calling me. Yes, those must be those uh, famous mermaid islands. But he sees his friend in trouble. Oh no, don't do that! And everyone panics as he gets into immense danger by slightly hanging above the floor by five foot. Bear in mind the rope is still on the boat. He could just slide back down it and be on the boat, but no. Instead, four people drag him all the way back rather than him just climbing down the rope again. <laughs> you saved my life. I was in absolutely no danger. <laughs> and the music did all of the work in that entire scene. No harsher master than the sea. That's a guy that's clearly never met Galadriel. But that was it. That was the scene. Entirely pointless. We didn't learn anything. Just a guy hung over a boat for a while. Gripping. There was lots of shots of just staring at his face, though. Whoever directed this episode really loves that guy's face. We get more drone footage of mountains, just sweeping landscapes. Drone footage of tides. The guy here blows his horn to tell him to all stop pushing the boats up the sand. I don't understand it, though, because he's like five foot away from him. He could literally just go, stop. Why do you need a horn? But you know when you've worked really hard on something and you're ever so proud of it, and then when it actually happens, in front of you, you realize that's, that's actually not very good. The sea is always right. That's one of those moments. It's just not as deep as you think it is. I wouldn't be doing that again. The sea is always right. Guess I spoke too soon. I do like how he's never said it though, because he's probably just like, no. Galadriel is always right. Although I must admit, these two characters probably have more character development than other main characters have in two episodes. Because they just say he was daydreaming, you get a little bit of friendship between them, and they go and talk about how in 10 years they're all going to be captains. This time next year, Rodney will be millionaires. But his sister turns up, and honestly, I still have no idea what the purpose was for any of these scenes. I also don't know why she exists, because she doesn't do anything in the entire episode. What are you doing here? That's exactly what I was thinking. She serves literally no purpose. But we get Muriel talking about the white leaves of the tree. Tree. There are multiple factions on the island, but the true believers think that these leaves do not fall for any reason. That the leaves symbolize the tears of the valor, and that their eyes and judgment are always upon them. And let's face it, if that was true, then Galadriel would have been smited a long time ago. Ain't no one could put up with her for thousands of years. No wonder they had to get rid of her husband. Someone sticking with her for that long would have just stretched incredulity. But she asks him his opinion, and he says, I don't want to spend my life guessing after signs and portents. But then she says, Elendil, it's an unusual name. It means friend of the elf. Just, are you an elf, friend? I must know. Oh, that's a pause. He doesn't really 
really answer, I am a loyal servant of Numenor. Well, you say that, but you brought an elf onto these shores. One which has not happened for a long time, my grandfather's time. You broke that precedent. So it's not a law then, it's just no one's done it for a while? Honestly, I don't know what all the fuss is about, but it's at this point we get quite possibly the best piece of script writing that we'll ever see in all of Rings of Power. Why? It was the sea that put her in my path, and the sea is always right. Oh, I can almost feel my brain cells multiplying. Just the depth and layers to the statement are astronomical. The sea cannot commit treason. I guess I spoke too soon. The sea is always right, but the sea cannot commit treason. But a stone sinks because it looks into the sea, it looks downwards. But the sea is always right and always good and always loyal and can't commit treason. So is the stone good and the boat which refuses to go down into the sea? Is the boat now evil because it looks up and avoids the sea, which is always correct? Seriously, I'm really enjoying learning the physics of this new realm. What is fire? Is it where wood just becomes happy? And at that point, he's worried about losing his head. But given the circumstances, I just did what I thought was prudent. I did what I thought was best for everybody. What was his other options? You wouldn't have let him go back to Middle-earth. Well, you're just going to let her die in a certain death, which she absolutely didn't choose herself. But with that, she gives him a mission to uh, guard Galadriel and make sure she doesn't get herself into any trouble. And for that, he'll need this special sword for some reason, which I'm not sure about, although apparently it means something to him. Back with the elf that definitely isn't an allegory. The sun comes out from behind clouds and all the orcs are suddenly like, ah, I've got to go. So he runs away, despite the fact that he's supposed to be guarding these people. This really doesn't seem like the best plan they've got here. Are we supposed to think, oh, he's paying attention. He's now realized their weakness because it was so incredibly subtle. I'm surprised he even noticed. He's using a makeshift axe, which I'm pretty sure wouldn't even be able to cut toast, let alone anything else. And we get another line of dialogue, which is purely there because we think the audience are imbeciles that can't remember what happened in the last episode. These passages reach all the way to Hood. We know. We were there when you found them. Possibly beyond. Orcs dig tunnels. Tunnels go far. This must be how they escaped our detection. We had to say that because we didn't think the audience could work it out and how they shield themselves from sunlight. That is the show literally telling the audience that if you go underground in a tunnel, then you can avoid the sun. And remember, writers write at the level that they personally would understand. This is what they need in their shows. The writers of this show could watch The Flash and just be, oh, I can't keep up, it's just too complicated for me. But it's like they're searching for something, maybe some kind of weapon, I have no idea. I don't know why you're speculating then. It says they go around ransacking village after village. How do you even know they're looking for something? That also gets them food and and workers. You have no idea to think they're after anything else. It's like they worship somebody else. They have a new leader. Adar. They say Adar's an elvish name. Why would they refer to their leader as elvish? Well, Sauron had many names. Perhaps this is another one for Sauron. They're literally doing the Wheel of Time tactic by just putting an obvious mystery in front of everyone and then trying to pretend that as many people as possible are the answer to that mystery. But it says the first opportunity anyone has to get above these pits, look for the tree line. And if we can, we'll make our escape and head towards it. Only one of us needs to escape and we can come back with an army and sweep these orcs out like ants. It's like salt from a table. Okay, the actual line was worse than I remembered. I would sweep you forward like salt from a table. Why are you pouring salt on a table in the first place? Well, the orcs like, stop talking, you elves. Get back to work. I don't pay you to stand around, peasants. And he's like, we cannot work. There are roots here. There's a tree in the way. We must go around. This tree's too old. Cut it down. And he tries to be diplomatic, which means that being an idiot isn't an elf thing. It's purely a Galadriel thing. Cutting the tree down will slow us down. It's far faster to go around it. Yeah, that's that's not gonna work. No, that's a mess at your back. Orcs don't really strike me as a type to just make threats. I feel like they just hit you and you'd learn. Unless there's just too much sun and they can't do anything except stand there on the precipice menacingly. <laughs> from whatever wretched place you grew. Probably California. But his diplomacy is stands up to him and this guy comes along and goes, yeah, have a drink. I reward strength with water. It's a trap. So he pours it in his hand to show it's not acid or something, I suppose. I'm still not quite sure about it. He eventually takes a drink. Honestly, I probably would have just tipped it up to my mouth and down again. Not actually drinking any of that filth. But he's like, oh, well, I haven't immediately died. So I should probably just give it to my friends. No, give it back. It could still be poisoned. So he gives it to Arundur, And I think being given it first means that he likes you the least. You're now the second one at most risk. But either way, he's just incredibly trusting and gulps it down. Then we go on to the third one, whose name I don't know, who never really contributed anything to this scene. And we've never seen... It's almost like we should have put him in a red shirt. And so the orc... No. Attacks him with his blade. Anyone who might fight back's restrained. And because this is a family show, you see the slightest 
kind of chip on his neck and they would have done better not showing it at all because quite frankly there's so little it's ridiculous i mean seriously that's all you get it's like he's cut himself shaving i know it's meant to be a family show but you could have just not shown it and it would have been way better rather than whatever that was but aaron durr is pissed i shall cut the tree down peasants so he finds out where the tree line is says some kind of elvish apology to the tree i suppose and decides he's going to single-handedly take it down with his tiny little axe there's, there's got to be a better way. Even when you cut it down, you've still got all those roots to get out the way. I don't know why you didn't start with the roots first. You probably could have just tunneled around it. The tree would have been fine. But back to Numenor and Galadriel's escaped. I mean, if I was sneaking from people, I would definitely leap across the road over their faces. Extra stealthy. She didn't even wait for them to pass. If that guy turns around, she is screwed. But we do find out why she is the only elf with long hair. Because she needs it to cover up her ears. The why to anything in the show always comes down to because we needed it to for this to happen. It's really engaging. But she starts looking at the boats to try and get one to Nick. Only to get caught. Yeah, you'd probably be better off stealing that other one over there. The boat you're looking at is awful. Well, it was better than the one I came in on. What? The one you referred to as certain death? You said the other one won't get you out of the harbour and then you'll be back at certain death. I know certain death isn't something you really concern yourself with considering what you did in the first episode, but maybe you want to start thinking about it. There's only so many times the writers can completely destroy their plot just for you. But he says the queen has given me a task. It's specifically to guard you and keep you out of trouble. Are you going to take her back to her quarters then? Because she has a Escaped. I believe she saw it as a punishment. Spending time with Galadriel is 100% a punishment. Then she and I have something in common after all. I'm glad you agree. We both wish you'd never brought me here. I can take you back into the ocean. We can drop you off right now if you want. You know, back in the certain death. You are literally writing her to be the most horrific person possible. And she's supposed to be the nice one. Always in the right, always doing the best thing. Every single other person in the world that's the problem, you see. I will take my chances on the skiff. You'll take your chances where he lets you. Hopefully, in the middle of the ocean. To shout for your minders. Pose the words never managed to escape your throat. And she goes back to threatening him after he saved her life from certain death. Seriously, every time she opens her mouth, she gets worse. You'll be back at the palace in chains, even further from your destination. Keep going, I'm failing to see a downside here. Who is this mortal who speaks to me as if he has the slightest idea who I am? You're just a miserable, self-indulgent, arrogant, entitled twerp. I know exactly who you are. And so does everybody that's ever met you, Galadriel. One thing no one can say about you is that you hide your true personality. One thing you can say about Galadriel, though, is she is honest because no one would fake having that bad a personality. I have a daughter who runs fast and a son who runs blind. Your eyes bear a striking resemblance to both. That's another thing that isn't as deep as you think it is. <laughs> Seriously, I don't know why they put these bizarre little analogies all over the place. They, they, they're not good. They're really not good. Where I run and how I run there are none of your concern. Except they are because you're under his guard and you agreed to be held prisoner for three days in that place. So you're not just an arrogant brat, you're also factually wrong. Anywhere is better than here. I still say we throw her back in the ocean. Let her fend for herself with the certain death which she is so excited to get back to. Where I'm hated by all who see me. I have a feeling that's everywhere you go, love. Get out of my way. But he talks to her in Elvish. And he's like, I can't believe you speak Elvish. But she finds out where he learned it and she's like, oh, can I see your hall? How far away is it? It's about a quarter of a day's ride. <gasps> I get to ride? First time she's ever been happy in her entire life, I think. Look, that's almost a smile. Then we get more sweeping landscape scenes with some very strange features. Seriously, this next bit reeks of, I've just bought very expensive camera equipment and I found out they've got this slow motion setting. I really want to try it out. I just need to come up with an excuse of how I can get it into the work. So she's riding along, not side saddle, like a lady would. Slow motion horse. More slow motion horse. Slow motion smiling Galadriel. Seriously, can we just keep her on a horse for the rest of the series? She might actually develop into a character anyone can stand. Imagine if she smiled more. <laughs> Slow motion ribbons. Judging by this, maybe that Twitter thread was right about why people ride horses. But we go off to this kind of castle library type place. Meanwhile, Halbrand's trying to get into the forge. He really wants to make something, anything. I'll do anything. I'll make an anchor for you free of charge. I just want to use your forge. I'm here to start a new. Let me that chance, please. I don't know whether we really are setting up the idea that he, I've changed. I just want to be good now. If only I can find peace, everything will be okay. 
until something happens which changes it all. I won't forget it. He managed to make that sound like a threat, and he's like, I'd love to, but until you pass all the stuff with the guild and you get one of these badges, I can't let you forge anywhere in the town. But he did say you've got to earn your guild's crest, so presumably that's going to take a while. What are you called again? Depends. Depends on what? How close we are. Subtle. The show's just always so subtle. But with that, this guy in the bar decides to come over and start winding him up. I hear you've got something to do with that elf which has come over here. You come over here taking our stuff, taking our food, taking our drink. Is there anything else you want? Can't possibly work out the allegory for this one. Our lands, our trades. Don't forget your women. He ain't happy with that. And so he brings over his lads to uh, teach Halbrand a lesson. And we get sort of the angry stare, the danger stare. Which person do I want to be? But all of a sudden he switches and he decides to be the nice person, the charming person, the really sociable person. Choose life. So of course I'm a guest here, I've shown you no gratitude. Beers for everybody! I don't know where he got the money from, but with that they're all friends. Keeping his hand remarkably close to that badge, and in quite possibly one of the most clumsy moves I've seen, we get this. So he steals the guy's badge and tries to make his exit. Thing is, I'm not sure how he wants to forge steel all of a sudden just because he's got a badge. Everybody knows who he is because he's new, and yet you want people to think that he suddenly earned a guild badge in like 12 hours? Really? Yeah, he thought that one through, didn't he? But after stealing the badge, turns out he actually realized what had happened all along. Did you think I wouldn't notice you stole from me? And in fairness, he offers it him back. It's not good enough. I don't want any trouble. Not sure that's your choice. So they surround him, start pushing him about, and decide to teach him a lesson. He tries to escape. It's not the most successful plan he's ever had. Please, don't do this. I'm trying to change. Yeah, it will be funny when every future action all comes down to this moment, won't it? That'll be some great writing. So they start smacking him about a bit, knock him to the ground, and at that point, I think they were gonna leave until we get this psychotic face. He headbutts one guy, back elbows another, and just starts taking everybody on. Pretty viciously. I'm pretty sure your arm's not meant to go that way. Remember when they said this was meant to be a family show and so that's why they couldn't show anything on that guy's neck? Then we get this scene, which is pretty brutal. I wouldn't exactly call it family viewing myself. <laughs> Especially when he starts ramming this guy's face into a wall. Call me Hellbrand. Was a pretty cool scene. Unfortunately, then the guards find him. Honestly, I don't know how we got response times that fast. That was crazy. But at least he's not stupid enough to fight them. So Gladriel draws Sauron's symbol on a piece of paper and they're trying to look for it to see if they can find anything about it. Like, I can't believe the Hall of Law was made by Alros himself. It's remarkable. Normally I wouldn't compliment anything, but now I found out it's made by an elf, I like it all of a sudden. I also knew his brother quite well. Thank you for bringing me here. So you should be thanking him. If it was up to me, you'd be in a dungeon by now, love. I ain't putting up with that kind of behavior. You literally threatened to kill him and said you'd prefer to be anywhere else, including the middle of the ocean, facing certain death, than be in his presence. And now you're like, oh, thank you for bringing me to a library, you're so amazing. Make up your mind. And he's like, well, you owe it all to the old king who saved this place. And she's like, oh, he was loyal to the elves? No, is loyal. He still lives in town in exile, in his own city. I'm not sure that's what exile means. They say he spends his days in the tower now, an exile in his own kingdom. That's literally not what exile means. He's not been exiled. He's still in the pissing town. I exile you to stay exactly where you are. <laughs> but the librarian comes back with information about the mark. I mean, somehow he just remembered where to find it. It's pretty impressive, actually. But he says it's a human spy and he wrote this symbol in order to remember where the tower was. How could I have been so stupid? Which is what everyone else has been been thinking about your character the entire show. This isn't a sigil, it's a map. And she goes over to look at the map, which is luckily almost entirely the exact region that she needed to point to so the camera can pick it up. That was handy. And just in case you can't work out the literally obvious thing that we're describing to you verbally, we're going to show you it in flames as well, because we think our audience is stupid. And if you still can't grasp what we've told you three different times now, it is a map of the Southlands. There's a fourth. Just to really nail it home straight into your face. Get it through your thick skull. And the text is of the black speech. It speaks of a plan to create a place where evil will not only endure, but thrive. And I wouldn't say it like that too often, love. You make it sound almost reasonable. We just want a home, lands of our own where we can live. <laughs> The plan will be enacted after Morgoth's defeat by his successor. It is worse than I imagined. Sauron has returned. I can't possibly imagine where he could be. And just in case you weren't aware of the importance of this moment. The music does a lot of the work for this show. <laughs> but realizing they'd probably peaked in that section, we've got to go to the Hobbits. I have no idea why. We've got to have lots of dancing and partying. Or we're going to repeat something which just quite frankly isn't true. 
Nobody goes off me. And nobody walks alone. That literally isn't true. As we're about to see later in this, the hobbits are savage. Oh, sure, they talk a big game about how no one walks alone and we all stick together. Right until you need them and they will leave you for dead without a second thought. Because this guy's broken foot magically just isn't better two days later. Honestly, I don't know what they were expecting. He broke his foot. And she says, we can't carry the cart without you. They'll leave us behind. What happened to no one walking alone? Very next scene. Oh, they'll leave us everywhere. <laughs> they literally want you to believe that there isn't a single other person in the entire village who isn't carrying a cart that could come and help them with theirs. There's not a spare son, a couple of daughters, nothing. Nobody can physically help you at all. If you get sick, then we'll just leave you to die. The Harfoots are savage. Brandyfoot is up to no good again. She's trying to enlist the help of her friend. Basically blackmails her. And the only real import of this scene is just some more of that quality script writing. There's head sense, Poppy, and there's heart sense. There's they were just so proud of it. it. Really isn't as witty as you're trying to make it seem. There's common sense and nonsense. There's common sense and nonsense. There's head sense and heart sense. It's like a couple of two-year-olds. So she blackmails her into helping, and she goes off looking at the head guy's book of stars. Still don't know why he's got a book of stars. Turns out later, he doesn't even know what's in his own book of stars. <laughs> well, there's not even that many pages. You'd think he would have read them. But she finds the page, and she hears someone coming. So you would think that she would take the page. No. Instead, she hides under his table. He sits down next to her, and so she's now trying to blindly grab the page that she forgot to take in the first place. And she's there, feeling around like that hand out of the Adams family. You're making tons of noise, and the guy sitting right next to her doesn't know. Apparently, he can sniff hunters at like 200 meters away, but he can't even hear someone literally knocking things over next to him. Mind you, it is Lenny Henry. You can't expect too much from him. So eventually, with the help and directions of her friend, she manages to get the page. And we go to what amounts to be a remembrance party for everyone they've brutally murdered by leaving them behind. Yeah, we just run from everything, and if you can't keep up, then we just let you die. <laughs> <laughs> and it is brutal because as he's reading it out and he's going, yes, we will leave people behind that can't push their carts. Everybody knows who they're going to leave behind and no one even says anything or cares. It's horrible, really. Yet it's all done in this kind of kind and caring atmosphere as if the show's trying to present it as a good thing. Not as, I tell you. Yeah, we're all gonna leave you to die, but I'll remember you. Ah, What a horrible person and civilization these people are. Remember when Amazon said that Lord of the Rings wouldn't be Lord of the Rings without hobbits? Did we really need this? Personally, I could have done without the hobbit murderers. I mean, we could have come together and helped people, but instead, bye! I'll remember you when you're dead. It's fine. Your name will go in the book. It's fine. We could not wait for them. You could wait for them. You chose not to. And then he starts reading out all the names. What a repulsive character. And they're trying to make out it's all like deep and caring. No, it's horrible. Why are you making all of your main characters impossible to like? The family they're all going to leave behind has even turned up to guilt trip them while they're there. But they still don't care. Not a single ounce of empathy or compassion between the entire lot. And they're all like pretending to be upset. Oh, I'm so sorry. I voluntarily left you to fall behind and die. <laughs> really upsets me. Lindsay Proudfellow. We wait for you. How ironic's that? We wait for you. No, you didn't. That's why they're dead in the first place. Specifically because you won't wait for anybody. Oh, it's rubbing salt in the wound, isn't it? But the wizard grabs the papers and decides to go and hold it over the fire right next to the people that he's supposed to be hiding from. Yeah, I see nothing going wrong with the combination of paper and fire. What could possibly happen here? Well, I never saw that one coming. So he starts to panic because he's destroying all of his information and for some reason decides to run across the entire camp with his paper, which is on fire. They obviously hear all this commotion while he might actually be setting everything on fire and he gets trapped in a net right in front of them all. I have a feeling the cat's out of the bag, or certainly is now. So the hobbits all find out that actually they've been caught considering they've been running for a thousand years and, and never waited for anyone, which is why so many people have died in the past. And so they all hide, except they haven't done it very well. You can see that leg down there in the bottom left. Them appearing is supposed to be very impressive, I think. Oh, look at our hiding skills as we just come out from behind walls and under these obviously green robes. And they're like, Nori, what have you done? He's like, I can't believe you've done it. You've brought an outsider into our mist. And you realize what the penalty for this is. It's to be decaravanned. Oh, that's going to be one hell of a punishment. I mean, you already can't carry your caravan and we were going to leave you behind anyway. But if we tell you we're leaving you behind, that's an entirely different story. 
but Nori starts pleading for them. You know, we fell from the sky. It's pretty unusual. I can't believe this has happened. How can you not be interested in it? So he decides to go against the rules and let them follow the caravan anyway, which is pointless because it's not like they can actually keep up. So it's the same problem. Nothing's changed, but he will make sure they're at the back. Pair of beans who had turned into stars, never the other way around. Are we sure that's not just another excuse you used when you murdered somebody by leaving them behind? Oh no, it's not that they couldn't keep up. They just turned into stars and went home. It's very troubling. Certainly is. How many of your friends have you killed because of your own laziness? But Nori asks, what do the stars on the page even mean? I mean, I did steal them from you and give them to the wizard, and now he's burnt them all, so I'm not sure how you're supposed to know. But what do they mean? The pages were all burnt up. Setting them on fire will do that to you. Why didn't you bother to read them? Why didn't you bother to read? They're out of your book. It wasn't very big. Are you telling me you haven't even read that thing? I thought we'd have time later. Well, you would have done if you hadn't set them on fire. But he says, tomorrow we deport and you're at the back. And all the family are incredibly annoyed with it. I can't believe you've done this. You just put us all at risk. You're about to die tomorrow morning anyway. They're gonna leave you behind. I don't know why everyone's blaming her when the hobbits are hideous people as it is. Miss Brandyfoot is young, but there's much hair still to grow on her toes as sense between her ears. I tell you, that witty banter just keeps coming out of the script, doesn't it? it it's literally dripping in it. But we're back in Numenor and they're very impressed with Galadriel. It's only because he hasn't met her. Galadriel, Scourge of the Orcs. Yeah, Galadriel's now Scourge of the Orcs. Wouldn't be a brother then that went around for centuries fighting people. No, it's, it's definitely Galadriel who just wandered around with a few guys in the snow for a bit. Scourge of the Orcs. Well, I'm not a lady, but now I am Scourge of the Orcs. Don't know why she didn't use that title earlier. But they all have a conversation, which just seems largely pointless. I don't know why anyone's here. They basically discuss who's going to take Galadriel back to Middle Earth and how it should be the sun. You can get a promotion. The son doesn't want to become a sailor, and he's really angry about it. Seriously, I don't know what that's got to do with any of the story. Her contribution is sitting there. The past is dead. We either move forward or we die with it. Guess it's time to do a Galadriel in episode one and two. Guess I'll die. So then there's a bit of familial guilt tripping. You won't believe the amount of work I've done to get you a promotion. It's the same level of soap opera banter that I would expect from an episode of She-Hulk. I wasn't talking to you. I wish you weren't talking to anyone. This entire scene's completely pointless. So she gets a message and leaves. And he's like, oh, I regret shouting at her. The watery part of this world has a way of healing even the deepest of wounds. There we go again. We're going to say something entirely nonsensical and people are going to think it's super intelligent because they can't understand it because it doesn't make any sense it's not witty it's not smart it just proves you've got as much hair on your feet as sense between your ears so instead of negotiating he just tells his son when they leave you will be on it yes because commanding someone in this position on a tv show always goes well yep he'll definitely do as he's told i'm sure and she's like father i made apprentice i don't care i've been accepted to the builders guild i can now be an architect We'll bully for you, but why is it in the show and why should I care? How does this benefit the story? How does any of this benefit the story? What has moved on during that entire scene? So Galadriel goes to visit Hellbrand, who is uh, in the dungeon after his recent escapades. And he's like, ah, I fell out with someone over a book. You do not belong on this island, Hellbrand. She says, I found this in the, whatever it was, the law chamber, was it? That symbol you carry, it means you're the king of the Southlands. This was a man who united all of the tribes and stood against Morgoth. I found this on a dead man. Take the hint, love. Seriously, how many times does he have to tell you before you just accept it? But no, no, we're gonna go through this charade. She says, these are your lands. You could do what your ancestor did and unite the tribes and stand against a new evil. Your people have no king, for you are that king. Dun dun da. It's an odd thing to say to a man in a cage. A cage you have landed in because you chafe under the rags of the common. You chafe under the rags of a common man. Ascend to my level. Become as arrogant and egotistical as me. You too will no longer chafe under the garments of a peasant. And the armor that ought to rest upon your shoulders. You deserve armor, Hellbrand. You deserve pride and privilege, nobility, titles. These are the things that matter, Hellbrand. These are what matter to me. I shouldn't say that, that's just how it all comes across. Egotistical little. But he's like, I'm just trying to decide. Should I be a real boy? Be careful, Hell. The heir to this mark is heir to more than just nobility. How many times does he have to tie you to your face, love, before you get it through your head? Judging by how the writers treat the audience, probably about another four or five minimum. But he says it was his ancestor who swore a blood oath to Morgoth. I am not the hero you seek. Done it again. Okay, three more. Three more now. He says it was my family who lost the war. But it was mine who started it. 
Let's bond over the destruction of Earth. Gotta admit, it's an original dating strategy. His ours was no chance meeting. It wasn't fate or destiny. It was obviously the work of a higher power. I could say Iluvatar, but I don't think I own the rights to that name, so I'm just going to hint at it. Nor any of the words men use to speak of the forces they lack the conviction to name. When, which is kind of ironic when you realize that she lacks the conviction to name it. Definitely not for legal reasons. I'm sure they own the rights to the name of literal god. Ours was the work of something greater. That I'm not going to name. But she's like, come with me, Halbrand. I need you. I saw the size of the dagger that you let me grab hold of earlier. Together, we will forget that I even had a husband. We will destroy Canon together. Redeem both our bloodlines. How? Oh. Based. And you're like, well, one problem, you're still short an army. Have you not considered that I am me? I can get an army whenever I want. I just have to walk into a room and be an absolute cow and everyone gives me all the things I could ask for. I have always gotten my own way. No one has ever said no to me. That is the secret of why I am such an insufferable bitch. So we get a bit more CGI drone footage and Muriel is doing the rounds. It is here, father. The moment we feared. The elf has arrived. I have a feeling Galadriel gets that reaction a lot. Just her appearing on the screen can make your stomach churn. <laughs> but the carts are moving, they've all got long grass on them because presumably they know they're going through long grass all the time. That's really likely. But everyone else is doing fine because they've all got plenty of people. Every family is pulling their own cart and not giving a crap about anybody else. We walk together. Nobody walks alone. We will wait for you. As you can see, there's plenty of people who aren't pulling anything at all and could quite happily be helping other people push theirs. There's actually tons of people who aren't pushing or pulling anything and could be helping everybody else. Here's a couple more that are doing absolutely nothing and could be helping people. But no, we're just going to wonder ahead because we're also lazy and simultaneously extremely bloodthirsty. That's why we're going to let a man with a broken foot desperately try to drag his family's house across a path and we're not going to help him at all despite the fact that we're doing nothing ourselves. This is disgusting. The hobbits are savages and I have no idea why they want to keep up with them considering how horrible they all are. So he starts grabbing his back, which I don't know why he does that because he's got a broken foot and you'd think that's what would be in pain first. But they're like, we've got to keep up otherwise we'll fall behind and die. They could be helping us, but they just can't be bothered. And that means we should stay with them. Why? They're clearly horrible people. You don't want to stay with them. But at this point, the wizard catches up to them and they realize, oh yeah, you realize that big guy? He can easily pull one of these. He's like twice our size. I don't know why no one thought about it till now. You do get to see his acting talent though. Friend. That's an Oscar winning performance if ever there was one. And she's like, oh, I said friend. I don't know if he knows what friend means, but he said it. And then she realizes, oh yeah, why don't we use the big massive guy behind us to pull it? This is how we keep up with the others, all of us. I don't know how you worked that one out so fast. You should be in Mensa. Can I keep him, ma'am, as a pet? Even him being in their nearby vicinity just means he, he yeah, I'm not going to wash. Why should I not? They, they aren't. And so off they go, desperately trying to catch up to the people who would have happily let them die, despite the fact that there was plenty of free people to help them on their way. The Harfoots are the most savage, bloodthirsty, murderous people that you can possibly find in this entire series. I think they're actually worse than orcs, because at least orcs don't care about you. At least orcs just go out and hunt people. These are supposed to be your friends. They're supposed to be the people in your village, and they don't care about you at all. They even have the nerve to write your name down in a book and then go, I'll wait for you, when specifically it's the only thing they didn't bother to do. How anyone wrote that entire story and thought that made sense and thought that we're going to like the hobbits after showing us that, I don't know. You're just completely insane. Insane or immoral. I don't, you certainly don't have a moral compass better than this orc. But the elves all decide that now's the time to fight the orcs. They start whipping their chains at them in their faces. I don't think that would really do any damage to them. Might be sort of a gentle annoyance across you, but it's not going to knock you over. But either way, they all start fighting. There's some very dodgy action sequences. <laughs> Didn't want to practice that a bit more to make it fluid. No, okay. But they put all the chains in one pile and just start hammering them to try and get anyone free. Meanwhile, the orcs are all under their cover because the sunlight's here and they're desperately getting reinforcements. One of the elves gets free and immediately makes a run for it. Only one of them has to escape. Unfortunately, an axe to the back will mean it's not her. The orcs at this point write off their losses and just start pulling on all the chains to teach them a lesson. We get this stupid tug of war sequence at this point, which um, it's no squid game, is it? But he thinks, I know, I'm an elf with a plan. So we get the trailer sequence where he decides to unleash his most lethal weapon, sunlight. They're like, oh 
no, I'm ginger and British. I can't stand the sun. It burns. So they retreat and decide to unleash the wog. Welcome to the CGI wog. However bad you thought it looked when you watched it, when I'm watching it back at two times speed, it looks even worse. Oh, can we keep it? So they decide to face off against the wog, who immediately goes and attacks the woman first. I'm not making any comments. Starts ripping out her stomach. It's a family show, you see. And this is my I'm angry look. Another elf decides to take on the warg and doesn't end very well for him either. Again, this scene, not a family show. But Arandur decides to do some weird just I'm going to fly through the air stuff, which somehow causes the warg to projectile fly at velocity which it didn't have previously into the tree. We just start wrapping it up inside the branches. That's th at this point, it all gets very strange. So being told not to help, his boss tries to free himself. Arandur gets yeeted by his chains back towards the orcs, flies backwards with a little twig. Not a family show. The boss guy breaks free, makes a run for it up the hill, almost gets caught by the warg, but wouldn't you know, Arandur is just amazing again. He really is the bestest ever. The only elf out of this entire place, really, which is any good at anything, as he's done literally everything in this entire scene. Almost reminds you of Galadriel and a troll, doesn't it? It's like some of them are just giving incredible plot armor, and, and everyone else is just an extra, a meat shield in somebody else's story. Really makes for an engaging TV show, that. Either way, the warg dies to the spear, Arendur gets his smug moment, and the boss runs. He's like, I need to see whether he escapes, but he's just standing there. Ah, uh, that arrow in the chest is gonna sting. Okay, two probably stings worse. So Arendur is is I think the only elf to survive out of literally everybody that was there. And for some reason, they go and like hug him and bring him down very carefully. They didn't care about anyone else, but him, no, we've got to, we've got to protect him. Or rather his plot armor protects him. Yeah, hold him down, lads. This one we've got to keep alive for some reason that we're not going to explain in any way, shape or form. Because we were going to attack him with the sword, but for some reason, no, this one's spared. This one has to go to Adar. Rest of them we don't care about, but there's just something special and unique about this one that I can't quite put my finger on. None of the other ones had it, they all died. But this one, whew, Arinder is a Elite. Dun dun dun, it's Adar, and the music's kicking off. This entire episode has been named after him. This reveal should be good. Your camera's not in focus, mate. Still not in focus. I guess we didn't have time to focus the camera. And what is there even to say? The plot hasn't been moved forwards. What we learned is that Galadriel is entirely insufferable, entirely horrible, and I can't think of a single reason why anyone wants to spend a moment in her company. The only time she smiled was on a horse. Twitter must have been right about that one. Hellbrand's story is just being beaten into your face at every opportunity, and I have no idea what's going on with Arendor. And the hobbits are evil savages. There is literally no redeeming them. The script is just as bad as the previous episodes with all of the same issues. You've got enough time to grow hair on your feet as you put sense into your face. Oh, well done. Someone give that guy an Oscar. I can't understand why with talent like that you weren't credited for Star Trek. And I think the main question comes back to, does it feel like Lord of the Rings? No. In fact, it doesn't even have a story and we are three hours into it yet and nothing's happening. Gladrill even admitted that she's destroyed the rest of the story because in the first episode, she jumped into the ocean to face certain death twice. So I have to ask, why was a billion dollars spent on this? And why was the billion dollars not put to scriptwriters who have talent? that can make a story that makes sense with a plot that moves forwards and characters which you actually like. arendur has got plot armor and Galadriel is one of the most horrible people that you've ever met in your life. And yet for some reason, everyone magically likes her. Of course I'm going to take you across the island exactly where you want, despite the fact that you've just threatened my life. Makes total sense. Just like everything in the entire show. I was so entertained by the show, the only thing I wanted to do while watching it was stop watching it. Congratulations, I think you've achieved a television miracle, a masterpiece of cinematic entertainment that redefines what's possible for television. At this point, I just have one hope. Maybe it'll get good by season three. Well, those are my thoughts. What are yours? Let me know down in the comments below. Like the video if you liked the video. Subscribe, more videos like this in the future, and I will see you in the next one. Bye-bye.